Now, you've heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, sometimes a picture needs a little more explaining. Uh, this, a couple right after the first year, you know how we do. We set budgets up and we start trying to follow a budget at the first of the year and things. And so this, this couple had set their budget. And so they went to the, the grocery store and they're going up and down the aisles and, and getting groceries and all. And so they, they come to a section where the man reaches up and takes off an uh, alcoholic beverage and goes to put it into the cart. And his wife says, no, that's not on our budget, and you can't do that. And, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's 20 some dollars. And she puts it right back up on the shelf. And he, he just keeps walking. They're walking, walking up and down the aisles, and they come to the beauty care section. And she reaches up and takes some beauty cream off and puts it in the basket. And he says, what's up with that? He said, I can't. He said, I thought we were on the budget. She says, but this makes me look pretty. And he said, we'd have been better off Let me buy the alcohol. You always look better to me. And so, and we'd have saved half the money. Picture paints a thousand words. He never knew what hit him. So, you know, we're in our final week of the series we're doing called Why Church. And we're just taking what I hope was a little different look of the church. And why church? Why is the church so important? Uh, and we, we examined it from the a- angle that God gave us the church. And through the church, he meets some of our most basic needs that we, we need as people. Not just as this is uh, Christ's church, but that he, the, the church, it gives us an opportunity to meet the needs. Things like worship. We were wired to worship and to lift up somebody and see somebody more important than ourselves. And, you know, we're wired that we need support and a family around us. And as a church, you're there to kind of keep each other on track, to expose, uh, you know, if, if uh, blindsided on something. When there's a tough time you're going through, the family there to pick you up. A place where you hear the Word of God and you study it together. Just all of those different needs are met. And this week, to me, is just another exciting purpose and need that God meets through the church. And today we're going to talk about the ministry of serving. The ministry of serving, service. Now, some of you, you know, that may excite, it may not, but, and you may not buy that whole thing. But listen to what Jesus himself said in Matthew 23, verse 11. He said, the greatest among you will be your servant. Jesus says, to be great, you must serve. You must be great at serving. Jesus was the greatest who ever lived. He was the greatest servant that there's ever been. And he had the greatest impact that there's ever been. And those things cannot be separated. Service. It's important in every area of our life. If you look at just think in the business world, the most successful businesses in the world built uh, built their business on serving the customer. Let this sink in for just a minute. Amazon. Amazon. I'm going to, let me ask you this. How many of you have used Amazon at some point or another? Just raise your hand there. Some of y'all I could have raised said, how many of you used Amazon this morning? You would have raised your hand. Okay, so I saw some hands go up right then. You know, you know Amazon, $1.59 trillion cap on that. I mean, that's what it's worth. They make billions every year. Why? Because we know we can order and if it's not right or doesn't work, they'll take it back. Service. Sure, they get it taken advantage of sometimes, a lot of times. But still, it was built on that. Service is not only important in business, it's important in the church. It's important to being a Christian. It's, it's more important than any business that ever been. But since service, servanthood or serving can be so easily misunderstood and is so easily misunderstood, Jesus wanted to help us understand what being a servant is all about. Jesus came and said, I set you free. You have been set free. I don't want you to be a slave to anything. But he said, I want you to be a servant. There's a big difference between unwilling and willing. And he wants us to be willing servants of Jesus Christ. And just like I said at the beginning, a picture paints a thousand words. Jesus knew that. So he wanted to paint a picture for his disciples that they would never forget. And that in turn, we have never forgotten. 
Just hours before Jesus was arrested, went through the trials, was crucified and buried, Jesus was spending time with his disciples, and this is what took place in John chapter 13. It's going to be on the screen. If you want to turn in your Bibles, that's where we're going to spend most of our time right there, John 13. <clears throat> Starting with verse 1, it says this. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Let's go to God in prayer real quick here. God, I come to you just now with one request, and is that we, our minds are open uh, to hear and see what you're teaching us, the picture that you're painting, that our hearts are receptive to what you want and need for us to do, and that we're willing, have a willing spirit, to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in talking about being a servant, it's good to know what a servant is, what makes up a servant. So let's look at some things. The first one is this, is that servants love. Yeah, to be a servant, you love. Everything Jesus did was motivated by love. I mean, everything he did. Now, we know the ultimate way that he was going to show his love was to go to the cross and die for all people to give them the hope and the promise of eternal life, anyone who was surrendered to him. We know that's the ultimate. But here he is wanting to show his disciples the extent of love that he had for them. And it says then he washed their feet. What are the things that motivate us to serve? <clears throat> well, I've probably tried them all. I've served out of guilt, out of shame, out of the desire to be obedient, the desire to maybe win some favor. But all of those motivations will fail. They'll fail me, they'll fail you. They don't last, they don't bring joy when that's the only thing that motivates us, and they will exhaust us. Ministry, serving out of love, just builds you up, it fills you up. Any other motivation empties you of energy and life. But Jesus was perfect, and we are not. And just in case it hadn't dawned on you yet that you're not perfect, let me save you the brain cells. You're not. I'm not. Your preacher's not. No, we're just not perfect. And because we're not perfect, our love is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect every time. We're not going to serve every time that we should. So we recognize our, uh, how that we're not going to be perfect in it that Jesus was. But we need to know that we need to grow in that. Just because we're not perfect doesn't mean that we don't strive to love like Jesus did. <clears throat> Motivation is the key. And where do we go for it? John told us. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because he first loved us. I mean, that's, that's it. That's, that's our charging station. That's, that's where we get filled with the motivation because we know that he has loved us and he's shown us how to do it. We're constantly reminded of God's love. Paul said it this way in Galatians 5, 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Remember, that's what we were just talking about. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. I just got to believe that the people that heard that the very first time, that was the last thing they were expecting him to fill that in at the last. You've been set free, but don't use it on yourself. Serve one another in love. But that's what he's called us to. Not to be a slave, but to serve in love. Every day, I get to choose. I get to choose whether I'm going to serve myself or am I going to serve God. And if you serve God, you're going to serve other people. And that's the choice that we get to make. Another thing about servants we love is that servants know who they are. 
Servants know who they are. Jesus was so secure in who he was that he was confident in what he was doing. Let me say that again. Jesus was so secure in who he was that he was confident to be able to serve the way he did. Servants know who they are, and they can be confident in what they're doing. We don't serve to earn favor. We're not afraid to serve. We don't think about serving, that serving is beneath us, or that what will someone else will think about us. You see, our identity is so huge to us in life. Always has been, but I think today more than ever. Knowing who you are, having your identity, is extremely important. I got a letter just a <clears throat> few months ago from an insurance company that I have a little insurance with. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they said they wanted to make me aware that there had been a data breach. Somebody had gotten into all the data that they had, and my information may have been exposed to the dark web, that somebody may have my information out there. So for me to be careful and diligent, I got, you know, that kind of makes me mad right there. I go, it was yours to keep, you lost it, and now I'm the one that's supposed to be diligent. You know? <laughs> but still, they're just warning you, somebody may be trying to get your identity. I got an email from uh, LifeLock. Some of you may use them as well. And it said that there had been recently a data breach where 26 billion records were compromised. There's constantly somebody trying to take our identity. And it's not a good thing. But past the business and the scammers and the hackers... The devil is always looking, trying to take our identity. He's always trying to confuse us and, and mislabel us and keep us so in our own minds trying to figure out who we are that we never feel secure, that we never feel confident to serve him. And if we spend all our time thinking about those things, we never have time to serve him. Knowing, listening to God and knowing that we are a child of the king that we're servants of God, that, we're, that we have a hope and a promise of eternal life, that not everything to be gained in life is just right here. Man, it makes you secure and it makes you confident in being able to do these things we can do for him. We can serve him well. Love is a great motivator, but it's also is knowing who you are. Here's the third thing. Servants meet needs. Jesus met a need in the life of his disciples. They had dirty feet. It's as simple as that. Now this, and at this day and time, it's so different than what we live in. They, they walked on unpaved roads, and everybody wore sandals or barefoot. So your feet became extremely dirty. Kid, adults, remember when we were kids, and you played out all, all day when you come in? That's the way it was. But not to be gross, but it was also you didn't sit at a table to eat like we do, and your feet go under the table. They, re, as it says, reclined at the table. So you kind of laid over on one arm. So your feet were somewhat extended towards the person beside you. Nobody got time for that. So it was not only a cultural thing to wash your hands and your feet, it was a very courteous thing to do that. And so that, there was a job. You see, somebody, somebody, if you go back and you read this section, Jesus had it lined up. We got this house that we can go to, and we're going up in an upper room, and we'll have this Passover meal. It was taken care of. Somebody had lined up the meal. Somebody had lined up for the water and the wine to be there to drink. Uh, somebody had taken care of everything. Somebody apparently had even taken care of the fact that there was a basin to wash feet and a towel. But nobody had lined up who was actually going to do the washing of feet. You remember as a kid, maybe you do it as an adult. I'm sure we do. We all do. When you, were, you saw something that needed to be done, but you say, uh-uh, I did it last time. Remember how many times you got in an argument with your brothers and sisters? Oh, it's not my turn. I did it last time. But yeah, but I did this. And you go back and forth. And you're always trying to pass it. I see, parents, I see people in here smiling because you know it's your family. That you all did this. We're all passing it back and forth. We sure do it a lot for something Something that's not very biblical. The Bible never said love one another when it's your turn. Forgive 
when it's your turn. You know, I can't help but think, and I don't want to add words to the Bible, but I can't help but think that when they walked into that room and saw everything ready, they're sitting around looking. Jesus isn't the only one that noticed that there were dirty feet. But I feel like somebody was waiting for somebody else's turn. And so they waited, and nobody did anything. And Jesus steps forward to do this. You see, it wasn't just the dirty feet. That was a need. That was an immediate need. But it was what was revealed behind that, that they had prideful hearts, that no one would step up <clears throat> and say, this needs to be done. I'll take care of it. And so Jesus, in meeting the needs, the immediate need, he also saw the need in the heart. And what he did was genius. He washed their feet. See, washing the feet of then was an immediate need, but Jesus used it to speak of serving in all needs. I just started writing down uh, this week as I was preparing just things we did as a church, just here recently, the how we're stronger as a church when you do these things, the build a bed, sleep in heavenly peace, where we've been able to get together and build beds for children. Uh, in the county you do not actually have a bed. Now, I could have tried to attempt to do something like that on my own, but how much stronger we were when it's everybody together. And you can knock out 50 beds like that. You can help 50 families that way. Or when we fill shoeboxes to send around the world, that it's not just one, but all working together, and there's hundreds of boxes. Or when we, so together we support missionaries that are around the world, and though we can't go there, they're already there, but they just needed the resources, and they're helping people in need and preaching the gospel. I think about that when everybody signs up to volunteer in an area in the church, that it's planned that somebody's going to be in the nursery or in the, uh, the kids' churches or whatever. I think about when people, the Sunday, when our Sunday school class, one of the things, great things we get to do is we combine each Sunday all the prayer concerns and then it's put together at the last minute uh, always somebody that volunteers that's on a rotation that they take all those names from a different class all the classes put them together print it up and get it passed back to the classes before class is out and you have right in front of you the prayer concerns for that week and the bulletins you have has a prayer concerns there and we're stronger that way because that many people can be praying or when we send cards to to sick and shut in and when we do it together and we bombard people with those things and they just keep coming or as you see those needs and you make phone calls or you fix a meal and it's already advertised I'm already uh, organized it if you've ever lost someone and you're a part of this church you know how nice it is that on a busy hectic crazy day that somebody's fixed a meal for you and you get to sit down and share a meal with your family those are things that we get to do. You're meeting needs. It's not, it doesn't begin and end with washing feet. We're meeting needs. And Jesus painted this picture that's lasted for over 2,000 years. And there are two kinds, uh, two kinds of needs. There's the planned needs where we get to say, well, I'll volunteer for this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of that. And when it's my turn, as we rotate around, we do this, you do it. But there's also the pressing needs. And those are the things that you don't know that are coming. And they happen at the moment. And you say, well, I'll step up and I'll do this. Because you don't know what's going to happen at every door you go through. You don't know a flat tire of somebody in the parking lot. Or somebody needs to make a phone call. Or somebody that you hear they've lost somebody. And you immediately step up and try to help. Those are pressing needs. So you're the, you can plan to help. But you've got to be ready for the pressing needs that you, know, you didn't have time to plan on. I get so tickled sometimes. I love to observe things uh, that how we'll walk through the church and uh, if there's a piece of trash or something, how many people will walk past it and we won't pick it up? So somebody's going to pick it up. Somebody should pick that up. And it's, I get tickled at this. This is just one of my favorites. I watch when we have our meals on Wednesday nights. And the, the trash cans are up there, and the ladies that are serving, the men that are serving, they're busy. And the trash just starts filling up. 
you know, and at some point, you know, they just keep place, putting plates on top of it, and it looks like the leaning tower of Pisa, you know, and I'm going, hey, not, nobody's going to try to put another plate on there, and then somebody will come and put two more plates on it, you know, and it's just leaning like this, you know. Let me tell you, we're not very territorial about the trash. You see that. How about just rolling it out? Roll it out to the trash can. You know, just you see a need, it's pressing, do something. Help it. If you walk past uh, the nursery and you hear some babies crying, it's okay to stick your head in the door and go, you need any extra help? And just do it. Step in to help. You see the needs, they're pressing, do those things. Final thing here. Servants serve imperfect people. This is the hardest one, I think. Servants serve imperfect people. Because we're imperfect people, anyone that we serve is going to be imperfect. And when they are imperfect people, they're going to respond in imperfect ways. Sometimes they're not going to be very appreciative. They're not going to say thank you. They're not going to learn their lesson and get right back in the same mess. Some will even reject Christians altogether. And so we get disappointed, we get frustrated, and sometimes we give up. But just remember, we never face anything from imperfect people that Jesus did not face. On this night, he knew within a few hours that he was going to suffer the greatest inhumanity that's ever been given. And he knew the men that he was washing their feet would have a part in it. Simon Peter would say, I don't even know you. Judas had already made a deal with the religious leaders to betray him. And all the others would run away when he needed them. He even says this, Luke 22 verse 24 says, Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. You talk about being slow to get the picture. These guys, the Lord's Supper had been instituted. He had washed their feet. And they're arguing about who's the most important. But Jesus did not let that stop him from helping these people. And as crazy as it sounds, we can't let people stop us from helping them. I know that sounds just backwards. But we can't let people stop us from helping. I just, some of the things that go through my mind over the years is Night of Lights, and um, where we try to reach out to the community, an in very imperfect community. And people, you know, just said, well, they threw trash all over the ground. You know, we think, well, let's not do it, you know, because they, they don't appreciate and they threw trash on the ground. Well, I hate to break it to you, but we're going to have to stop Mr. J.D. from passing out Lifesavers on Sunday because you wouldn't believe the Lifesaver papers we pick up around here. But you don't think we're going to do that, do you? We're going to stop passing out bulletins because you wouldn't believe how many Miss Barber have to pick up off the floor and out of the pews. No, we're imperfect people. And we're going to respond in imperfect ways. So we can't let that stop us. The truth is people are going to disappoint us and people are going to frustrate us and people are going to fail us. But that cannot be, imperfect people cannot be the determining factor in whether or not we serve. People have quit churches because people have hurt their feelings or disappointed them. Or if they didn't quit the church, they just backed away and stopped giving, serving, engaging. And if that's you, <clears throat> it's time to recommit. It's time to re-engage. When, when it came time for <clears throat> Simon Peter to have his feet washed, you've you got you to gotta picture it in your mind as well. Jesus starts washing their feet. And if you were not the first one, you got to picture what's happening here. Is it's coming. See it coming down the line. And Simon Peter, <clears throat> he sees what's going to take place. And Simon Peter says this to Jesus in John 13, verses 8 and 9. He says, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And you got to love Simon Peter. He says, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Simon Peter was wrong a lot of times. But what makes him so right is that when he saw he was wrong, he was fully engaged. 
he may have not been right in what, he, what Jesus was saying, but he said, well, if, it keeps me, if, if, if it's going to keep me from being with you, Jesus, then wash me from head to toe, not just the feet. He recognized the offer that Jesus had given and that to be a part of this, he had to go along, needed to go along. You see, what's so important about this is if we cannot see Jesus as the servant leader, we will never follow him into service. If we can't see Jesus as leading in service, we will have an almost impossible chances of following him into service. I want to close with this story. <clears throat> and I told this in some setting. I can't remember if it was a Wednesday night or in a sermon some time ago. But I was in college and I traveled uh, in a ministry group and we traveled to churches and sang and did all kind of youth things. Traveled throughout the summer. And one, one summer <clears throat> We worked at a camp up in Virginia that the campers were not your usual campers. These were adult, uh, either mentally or physically handicapped uh, individuals, and they had a week of camp for them. And we were the workers. So here I am, about a 20-year-old um, young man, and I'm in this camp, no training, nothing what to expect. And I got assigned to me, like several, like a lot of others did, I had a, a man, grown man, who was uh, confined to a wheelchair. And so I had to do everything for him. That was my job, to do everything for him. And I was overwhelmed, I'll be honest with you. Uh, and he was not always the nicest man. <laughs> he was kind of like a grumpy old man. So he didn't always appreciate what you were doing for him. And I remember one evening... Uh, we had eaten supper, and I don't know if he got choked or, or whatever, but he threw up all over himself. And I'm not talking about the cute little baby spit up on a shoulder, and you wipe their mouth, and you smile about it because it's so cute. I'm talking about full, lost everything. All over his shirt, his pants, it was in his shoes. It was just everywhere. And guess whose responsibility that was? It was mine. And uh, me and another friend, we took him to the showers, and uh, we got him cleaned up and changed clothes. And uh, once again, I'm telling you, I'm completely overwhelmed. I don't know what I'm doing. But the part that I remember the clearest was, was after we got him cleaned up and in bed, there still was the wheelchair. And I'm not trying to be gross, but cold vomit. In a day that nobody knew what latex gloves were, that's what I had to do. And I remember completing that task into the night, and I went back to my cabin, everybody's in bed, and I got a flashlight out, and I wrote a letter to my mother. And I just thanked her. I said, for, thank you, Mama, for cleaning me from both ends for all of my life. And never once said thank you. I'm not kidding about this. That was a defining moment in my life. I realized then I was called to serve. No matter what it is, I'm called to serve. I may not like what I'm having to do when I'm serving, but you can love serving. So how about you today? What's the defining moment in your life? What's going to be the time that you say, just like Simon Peter said, no, Lord, but then something changes and says, I'm all in. I'm all in, Lord. Let it begin today.